On this week in Enterprise Tech, Cloudflare's DNS was down, making it a black hole for some sites and services. We'll talk about what happened. Plus, the Twitter breach is a reminder that some corporations might need to protect their social media use. Curtis will take us through that. And Brian McHenry and Curtis and I talk with a great guest, Satesh Patel, Senior Director of Product Management at F5. And we're going to discuss some challenges around DevOps and end-to-end integration. Shouldn't miss it. Try it on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 403, recorded July 24th, 2020. Forbidden Wheeling. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Security Scorecard. Security Scorecard helps enterprises manage digital threats with a 360-degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. To learn more and sign up for your free account, visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. And by Salesforce Service Cloud. Salesforce Service Cloud is the world's number one customer service platform that empowers organizations to deliver service from anywhere, from home, in the office, or in the field. Go to bit.ly slash Salesforce for service to find out more. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, especially right now, but there's one place you can go. You can get a quality candidate within the first day. That place is ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twice. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm Louis Moreski, your host, your guide through this big giant world of the enterprise, but definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own, one of our security experts here. He's the director of global security solutions over at F5 Networks, Mr. Brian McHenry. Bam! It's always great to hear you and see you. How are things on the East Coast? Good, good. Just moved into a new home. Um, so broadcasting live, if the background looks different, uh, coming coming straight to you from my new office digs. Um, and uh, a little network nerd moment, right? Buy a new house. What do you look for? You look for the right number of bedrooms, bathrooms. Well, I'm a networking nerd, and I was really excited that this house is, is fully wired with six Ubiquity eight access points all over the house. So it is a, a very nicely networked home, uh, and that's got me uh, pretty stoked. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, you've been remote working for a while. Have you have you seen any new challenges coming up uh, on you, especially in a new, new place like that? Um, you know, getting... Xfinity's uh, service up and running reliably within days of uh, moving in was 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 a, a, a pretty serious challenge. I thought it, we had it all set up, and then yesterday I spent about two hours troubleshooting like why our speeds had gone from like 300 megabits download to something like uh, a 10 lossy download, and apparently they uh, they canceled my service order, which was nice. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Well, folks, speaking of experts, we have our favorite security and enterprise journalist, Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's the senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, how are you, my friend? Oh, doing pretty well, Lou. It's a warm day here in Florida, but uh, that's okay. It's a great time to be inside talking to everyone on Twyat and uh, busy getting ready for Black Hat and DEF CON coming up now in just a couple of weeks. Some great stuff that's going to be going on virtually, as uh, DEF CON says, it's going to be in safe mode this year. And I think that's the uh, watchword for everyone this year. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm starting to see a bunch of posts and possible content, I think, starting August 1st. How are things gearing up for you? Are you getting interviews? Are you getting ready to, to, to attend some of the sessions? Doing interviews, uh, doing a couple of articles. I've had a couple of posted uh, this last week in anticipation of Black Hat, you know, sort of previewing things. And I will be there virtually. I'm going to be covering uh, the show just like I would be if uh, we were all going to be out in Las Vegas together. 
So I think it's going to be a, an interesting time. You know, I get to cover things, get to talk to people, interview folks, and I still get to sleep in my own bed. That's a pretty good deal, if you ask me. Very good deal. Very good deal. Well, speaking of gearing up, it's been a very busy week in the enterprise. You may have felt the pain when you tried to access your favorite website or service out there. Well, there might have been a hiccup in Cloudflare's network, making a black hole for some of the sites. We'll talk about what happened there. Plus, the Twitter breach is a reminder that there may be needing some more work on protecting our corporate social media use. And Curtis will take us through that. And we have a great guest, Hitesh Patel, Senior Director of Product Management over at F5. And we're going to discuss some of the challenges around DevOps, some of the trends that you're seeing out there, and maybe even just how to handle that end-to-end -end scenario. But first, it's been a definitely really busy week in the enterprise for news. So let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, most security researchers try their best to report the exploits and issues they discover to the right people. Now, sometimes companies are non-responsive. Now, some just don't believe there's actually an issue. Now, that doesn't sound right in this day and age, does it? Well, according to Dr. Neil Kravetz, he has tried his best, but has literally spent years trying to report security vulnerabilities to none other than the Tor project. Now, according to him, just finding who to report bugs to was like a scavenger hunt. Now, after a public shaming of the Tor project in 2017, they changed their website design to make it easier to report vulnerabilities. They also opened up their own bug bounty program called Hacker One. But unfortunately, while it's easier now to report vulnerabilities to the Tor project, they are still unlikely to actually fix anything. Now, for an organization that prides itself on their secure solution, it's unclear why they won't actually fix serious known issues. Now, what really has set off Neil was this year there was two events that actually ended up being the last straw. Now, the first issue related to a massive DDoS attack over the Tor network last February. Now, lots of Onion services were offline, and many relays actually crashed here. Now, the vulnerability was reported to the Tor project, but they doubted the issue and called it just theoretical. Not so theoretical anymore, is it? Now, the second tried to report the vulnerability in the Tor browser to the Tor project. Now, the bug was simple enough. It's using JavaScript you can identify the scroll bar with. Now, each operating system has a different default scroll bar size, so an attacker can actually identify the underlying operating system of the user by narrowing down the attack surfaces for Tor users by just using that data. Now, he reported the issue and eventually got it accepted. Not without a fight. And they marked it as a high-priority resolved issue. They resolved it. And they even paid him for the bug bounty. Fast forward three years, it still wasn't fixed. Now, this pushed Neil over the edge, who currently is sitting on dozens, that's right, dozens of zero-day attacks or vulnerabilities for the Tor browser and the Tor network. Now, since the Tor project does not respond to security vulnerabilities, he decided to start making them public. Now, he's making them public one week at a time with the data and evidence of their validity. Now, the Tor project made it hard to report vulnerabilities. They failed to fix vulnerabilities, and they marked issues as resolved when they were never fixed, and they outsourced simple issues like passing a simple scroll bar issue upstream to F Firefox where it was never fixed. And they make excuses for not addressing serious security issues. Let's see if they start listening now. Well, North Korea's Lazarus Group has been busy. They're developing cross-platform malware frameworks. Now, the Lazarus Group is an advanced persistent threat group linked to North Korea, and it has developed an advanced malware framework that's been used to launch and manage attacks against Windows, Mac OS, and Linux systems in at least a dozen organizations, according to an analysis published by security firm Kaspersky back on July 22nd. The framework has been used against victims in Germany, India, Japan, South Korea, Poland, and Turkey, according to the researchers. The attacks have focused on e-commerce businesses, internet service providers, and software developers. Now, unlike many nation-state groups that have political mischief as their goals, North Korean cyber espionage operations often have a strong financial goal. For example, in 2017, researchers linked Lazarus with the WannaCry ransomware worm that caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage worldwide. Most recently, Lazarus has been linked to credit card skimming, stealing credit card data from the websites of online retailers. In the latest development, the Lazarus Group has created a framework dubbed Mata that has been used to steal customer databases and distribute ransomware. The framework appears to use code from an open source proxy server that Lazarus has further developed. Among other features, the framework appears architected to work on connected Linux devices, raising the possibility that... Um, Internet of Things devices could be next on Lazarus' list. 
The Matinet orchestrator uses TLS 1.2 to encrypt communications. And because this sim of similarities in the code, including things like file names and global configuration data between Mata and other Lazarus distributed texts, Kaspersky feels pretty confident in saying that this framework is the work of North Korea. Does the First Amendment let ISPs sell web browsing data? At least one judge is skeptical. The broadband industry has lost a key initial ruling in its bid to kill a privacy law imposed by the state of Maine. The top lobby groups representing cable companies, mobile carriers, and telecoms sued Maine in February, claiming the privacy law violates their First Amendment protections on free speech and that the state law is preempted by deregulatory actions taken by Congress and the Federal Communications Commission. Maine's web browsing privacy law is similar to the one killed by Congress and President Donald Trump in 2017, as it prohibits ISPs from using, disclosing, or selling browsing history and other personal information without customers' opt-in consent. The law took effect on July 1st, 2020. The case is not over, though. The ruling today by Judge Lance Walker in U.S. District Court for the District of Maine dealt a major blow to the broadband industry's lawsuit. The plaintiffs representing the broadband industry are America's Communication Association, CTIA, NCTA, and U.S. Telecom. Walker denied the plaintiff's motion for judgment on the pleadings, criticized the industry's First Amendment argument, and granted Maine's motion to dismiss claims that the state law is preempted by federal law. This case and others like it related bear watching as the U.S. seems slow to adopt these more consumer-oriented privacy laws like the European Union's GDPR. Now, this next story hits close to home since I've had several ideas actually stolen from me after I've gave pitches to potential investors. Now, who would have thought Amazon would be involved in such behavior. Well, when Amazon Venture Capital Fund invested in Defined Crowd Corp, it gained access to the technology's startup finances and other confidential information. Now, nearly four years later in April, Amazon's cloud computing unit launched an artificial intelligence product that does exactly what Defined Crowd does. Now, the new offering from Amazon Web Services called A2I competes directly with one of their bread and butter foundational products that collects and labels data. Now, Defying Crowd is one of more than two dozen entrepreneurs, investors, and deal advisors who said Amazon appeared to use their investment and deal-making process to help develop competing products. Now, in some cases, Amazon's decision to launch a competing product devastated the business in which it was invested. In other cases, it actually met up with startups about potential takeovers, sought to understand how their technology works, then declined to invest and later introduced a similar Amazon-branded product, according to some of the entrepreneurs' investors. Now, dealing with Amazon is often a double-edged sword here because Amazon's size and presence in many industries, including cloud computing, electronic devices, and logistics, can make beneficial to the work being done. But revealing too much information can expose companies to competitive risks. Now, get this. The most recognizable example of this blatant abuse of power has been, well, none other than the Echo Show. That's right. The device you have in your kitchen right now. Back in 2016, a group of investors led by the Alexa Fund bought a stake in Nucleus, a small company that made a home video communication device that integrated with the Alexa voice assistant. A year later, no deal, and the Echo Show debuted. Now, I guess this is a lesson for all of us. If you have an idea, take it to market and do your best to partner with VCs and investors that want to see you succeed and not stick their own label on it. Ripple 20 effects could have an impact on the IoT cybersecurity for years to come. An Israeli cybersecurity company named JSOF has managed to uncover a series of zero-day vulnerabilities in an old TCP IP software library. In total, JSOF discovered 19 of these vulnerabilities, but named the batch of flaws Ripple 20 to illustrate the ripple effect these security defects could have on connected devices for many years to come. The specific flaws themselves were determined to have spawned from a Cincinnati-based organization named Trek Inc., that built network protocol stacks for embedded system vendors. As a result of the suite's popularity, the vulnerabilities were able to infiltrate the mar global markets unnoticed through the global supply chain. It's important to consider the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS, scores for these vulnerabilities. These scores, on a basis of 1 through 10, reflect not only the criticality of the flaw, but also the degree of knowledge required to exploit the flaw, basically the more severe and easier it is 
to uh, exploit the vulnerability, the higher the score. Now, unfortunately, four of the 19 Ripple 20 flaws have a CVSS score of 9 out of 10 or higher, meaning they can be weaponized for devastating impact without requiring extensive expertise from the attacker. While JSOF has provided recommendations to help mitigate the risk of Ripple 20, the overall reach and scope of the flaws have significant market implications. It should be noted that while Trek was quick to update its TCP IP stack to a version that addresses these vulnerabilities, uh, that's the easiest part of the security fix. Unfortunately, even after being notified that their products are affected, installing the patch has proven difficult for many vendors who never designed their embedded devices to be updated. As a result, these vulnerabilities are likely to be part of the IoT landscape for years to come, making add-on security a necessary piece of any reasonable IoT deployment plan. FBI nabs Nigerian business scammer who allegedly cost victims millions. The more remote workers and people online, the more targets for cyber criminals and scam artists. The pandemic has amplified the effects of such attacks and has gotten people wondering what can be done. It seems that the U.S. government hasn't slowed down on catching some of the notorious cyber criminals out there. They recently gained custody of a Nigerian man who is accused of participating in massive fraud and money laundering operation. The defendant, Ray, quote unquote, Hush Puppy Abbas, has amassed 2.4 million followers on Instagram, where he flaunts his access to luxury cars, designer clothing and private jets. The feds say they gained his wealth by defrauding banks, law firms, and other businesses out of millions of dollars. He was arrested last month by authorities in the United Arab Emirates where he had been living. Now, the FBI's criminal complaint details how the government obtained a wealth of information tying Abbas to his alleged crimes. Abbas was an avid user of American technology platforms, including Instagram, Gmail, iCloud, and Snapchat. Accounts on these platforms were all registered using a handful of common email addresses and phone numbers. Abbas's main email account, rayhushpuppy at gmail.com, included a copy of Abbas's lease at a luxury hotel in Dubai and scans of various government-issued photo IDs under Abbas's name. Abbas is accused of participating in a number of business email compromise scams. By posing as trusted employees or customers of a target organization, Abbas and his fellow fraudsters allegedly tricked employees into sending large sums to bank accounts they controlled. Spear phishing and phishing and what is even now called whaling, going for the biggest fish, continue to be the most frequent attacks many of individuals and enterprises alike must deal with. It's worth looking into enhanced cybersecurity awareness training and the pervasive use of tools like two-factor authentication to help mitigate the risks associated with these types of threats. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with an AI assistant? Well, you, you can get maybe one question in and then they return something you didn't want to talk about or an answer that doesn't make sense. What if you can have an open conversation with one? What if they could write an entire unique and creative topic of that paper for you? What if they could write some code to support it? Well, that's where the world of social media is up in arms about the new AI system or open AI system called GPT-3. Now, it's called Generative Pre-Training or GPT-3 for short. Now, it's a language generation tool capable of producing human-like text on demand. Now, the software learned how to produce text by analyzing vast quantities on the Internet and observing which letters and words tend to follow one another. The company wants developers to play with that system and see if they can achieve it, achieve more with it before rolling out a commercial version later this year. Now, it's unclear how it will, how much it will cost or how the system will actually benefit businesses, but it could potentially be used to improve chatbots, design websites, and prescribe medication. Now, the system is a huge step forward, but if we look back for a second, OpenAI's release of their previous release of GPT-2, you'll find that they were reluctant to release it due to potential of people using it maliciously. Now, OpenAI was set up as a nonprofit with a $1 billion pledge from a group of founders that included Musk. Now, in February 2018, Musk left the OpenAI board, but he continues to donate and advise the organization. Now, OpenAI made itself not for profit in 2019 and raised another billion dollars from Microsoft to fund its research. Now, GPT-3 is set to be OpenAI's first commercial product, and Reddit has signed up 
as one of its first customers. Now, it looks like OpenAI is set up to succeed here. Now, I guess one could think and ask is if you assume they get NLP or natural language processing to a point where most people can't tell the difference, the real question is, what happens next? Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Security Scorecard. Now, with all the organizations I work with, I can tell you they're always looking for ways to audit themselves and assess their cyber risk, especially with the way the current climate is and the ever-changing security landscape. Now, Security Scorecard is the global leader in cybersecurity ratings and the only service with one and a half million companies continuously rated. Now, their mission is to empower every organization with collaborative security intelligence because you are only as secure as those who actually work with. Now, we always say here in Twi, you're only as secure as your weakest link, and that's definitely your users. Now, Security Scorecard helps enterprises manage digital threats with a 360-degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. They have a patented rating technology used by over a thousand organizations for many, many use cases. Now listen to these. You can evaluate your organization's cybersecurity risk using data-driven, objective, and continuously evolving metrics that provide visibility in your organization's information, security control weaknesses with their security scorecard ratings. Now with you can instantly view the cybersecurity posture of any third-party vendors partner or suppliers to help you evaluate the risk of your ecosystem you can also allow them to find and fix cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities across your externally facing digital footprint with their third party risk management system. Now they're also used for board and executive level reporting and in the insurance space for cyber insurance underwriting. Now, Security Scorecard is always working for you behind the scenes. They have non-intrusively collect data from publicly available feeds across the internet for an outside-in perspective here. Now, the data is used to calculate scores across 10 key risk factors here, such as patching cadence, application security, DNS health, network security, and endpoint security. Now, an A to F grading scale helps companies easily understand the continuously monitor the cybersecurity posture of any organization. In fact, companies with a C, D, or F are actually five times more likely to be breached. Now, Security Scorecard Atlas, it's the leading cybersecurity questionnaire and validation system. It cuts through the questionnaire noise so you can find out your score to make your business cyber secure. Now, Alice's centralized platform lever leverages machine learning to automate the cybersecurity questionnaire exchange process for, for senders and receivers and in making it two times faster and more accurate and secure. Now, Alice is the only platform in the market that instantly maps cybersecurity rating data to individual responses, providing a true 360 degree view of risk. Now, cut the questionnaire cycle in half. Save hours with 20 plus industry standard questionnaires or their customized questionnaire wizard. Now collaborate easily and securely with your team and third parties. Now Security Scorecard believes that every business has a right to own its own security rating. That's why they were awarded the best product for security ratings by 2020 SE Magazine Awards. Now I hope you've been listening because Security Scorecard is something all organizations should be using to assess their risk. The combined power of security scorecard ratings and Atlas gives organizations a 360 degree view of cybersecurity for any company in the world. Sign up for your free account by visiting securityscorecard.com slash twit. Check the score of your business and up to five others. To learn more and sign up for your free account, visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. And we thank Security Scorecard for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, you may have been affected recently by networking issues last Friday. Now, in fact, many large scale sites and services appeared to be down, actually unreachable here. Now, what was the cause? Well, Cloudflare's DNS service was the culprit. Now, the outage seems to be starting at it started around 2.15 p.m. Pacific time, right during our Twilight show, actually. We actually saw some of the effects and it lasted for roughly around 25 minutes before connections began to be restored. Now, social media swarmed around the idea almost immediately that this may have been an attack on the internet and the internet was being taken down. Of course, they had to jump to that first. However, Cloudflare was quick to jump to social media to call out the cause of the issue. Now, can you guess what it was? That's right, a configuration issue. Now, if you remember last year, Amazon AWS had a similar issue when a bad configuration made its way through the rings in the production ring, affecting thousands of people. Well, according to Cloudflare, 
The issue appeared to be that a router in Atlanta announcing bad routes, effectively a route leak. Now, fortunately, it had a limited impact, only impacting their backbone. And since not all of their POPs are connected to their backbone, not everyone saw the issue. Now, but it does appear the impact was around 50 percent of Cloudflare's traffic for the period of time it was down. Now, Cloudflare later confirmed that the issue was caused by a mistaken configuration applied to a router during a route, uh, route routine update. Now, here there was no attack. And it was not a failure of the router's software. It was essentially human error and not enough automation and gates to catch it in the in the pipeline. Now, when we bring on the guest later, I'm definitely want to get his take on this issue too, because I think it's a great topic for that. Now, Chris, I want to I want to throw this to you first because is this just even more proof that DNS is a weak link and it needs overhaul here? Well, I'm not sure that DNS by itself is such a weak link. I mean, it's, it's a vital piece of the foundation of the Internet. But what it does show is that there are relatively few authoritative DNS servers out there. Uh, there are really about half a dozen that the majority of people use. And uh, when one of those goes down for whatever reason – it's going to have uh, sort of an outsized impact. Uh, so I think this is one of those things where the call to action for most organizations and individuals is going to be to use their configuration uh, in their routers and on their workstations to do things like have multiple DNS servers. You know, in most cases, you can have multiple addresses that you resolve to so that if it fails on one, it drops to the second and so on. If yours doesn't, it's time to go take a look at that. Agreed, agreed. Well, Bam, I'm going to throw this to you because DNS is vulnerable in all kinds of mishaps, mistakes, and even vandals. Now, with secure DNS and DNS over HTTPS or TLS, do you think this will make it better, make it worse, not really affect it at all? What do you think? Well, um, in this particular case... Um, Security DNS doesn't help us at all, uh, and the reason is is that it was the underlying network, right? We have you have the OSI model. It's always good to kind of look at where problems have occurred, uh, and and in this case, the problem wasn't with DNS. It was how did we get to how can we get to the DNS server, and the how do we get there is is at a lower level, is at the network level, and in this case, BGP is the culprit. So the, one of the things that gets you know people are like, oh, I hear a DNS outage. Can we secure DNS? I'm not saying we shouldn't secure DNS. Absolutely, we should make it more secure, get to DNS over TLS or DNS over HTTPS, some some way to secure it so that we don't have man in the middle of DNS tampering. Um, but in this case, we're looking at a BGP problem. This is the network getting screwed with. And many times on this show, we've talked about how easy it is to compromise BGP and reroute huge swaths of internet traffic uh, through China, for example. We've seen that recently. Um, and this is a case where a misconfiguration happened, um, but it could have just as easily been, a, been another attack uh, on the BGP infrastructure causing a reroute of traffic or a stoppage of traffic. Right, right. Now, Chris, you know, as noted, a lot of you guys are saying, hey, like the sites were down, but they were just not resolvable. It's not that they were down. It's that they were not resolvable. Now, we talked a little about, hey, BGP is a problem. The network straight layer is a problem. What is there anything that a site or service can do here to combat this problem? Uh, obviously, because it's a DNS hiccup um, or BGP hiccup. You know, they're not unreach they're not unreachable. You can still reach them via IP address or something else. Is there anything else an organization do can do to combat this, or they have to just wait for their DNS service to come back? Well, it's it's one of those multi-layered problems because if, for example, a, a company and its website, if their upstream DNS services were were somehow compromised, then the solution would be to have uh, additional failover DNS services. That's where something um, uh, like uh, you know the uh, the DNS services that that we've seen throughout the years can be can be of real help because it means that if your upstream provider is down for whatever reason, then you can fail over. The problem that was going on here though was not so much that the companies. Um, who had the web servers were having the issue. It was that all the people who were trying to reach their web servers were having an issue. 
And unfortunately, there's just very little a company can do about that. I mean, you can be uh, advertising your location as loudly as you want, but if uh, all of your customers are tuned to another channel, now that message isn't going to get through. Right, right. Well, it, it actually talks about a little bit more about how we can secure, and not secure, but actually make this protocol a little bit better. I mean, there's there's lots of ideas out there. Uh, but like you said, sometimes you're just a slave to the system. So we'll see how that goes and see how that kind of evolves over time. Well, folks, that does it for that bite. I do want to move on to the next bite because, you know, we've everyone, a lot of people have actually were um, affected by the Twitter breach uh, this past week. Um, and it, it throws out some reminders that maybe organizations should start protecting themselves a little bit better on social media. So I want to throw it to Curtis because he has some great ideas. Curtis? Yeah, this is one of those cases where the actual number of accounts that were breached was very, very small, but they were very, very visible. You know, on Wednesday, uh, Twitter had a breach. Uh, they had attackers who took over the accounts belonging to roughly 45 individuals and did so in a way that allowed them to look at the direct messages of at least 36 of those individuals. Now, when they had control of the accounts, what they were doing was enacting a fraud, a scam, telling people that if they would send them Bitcoin, if they would send them cryptocurrency, well, they would send back larger amounts. And this was happening from accounts of you know people like uh, the uh, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden and um, Bill Gates. So people are more likely to fall for something coming from a trusted source, especially when there's not a long record of these accounts being taken over. Now, one of the things that Twitter has been doing, the first thing they did was shut down access and they ended up shutting down the access to all of their verified accounts. These are accounts that Twitter has for high profile individuals. So that they can be sure that, well, the Twitter account belonging to very important person, Sally Smith, is actually controlled by very important person, Sally Smith. They ended up shutting down the ability of all of these accounts to tweet for several hours while they recovered the control of these 45 high profile accounts. Now, they haven't announced who the attackers were. They probably don't know. They do say that they were able to gain access to the accounts by spear phishing Twitter employees. Now, I, I did a piece for Dark Reading earlier today where a couple of former employees said that there were over a thousand individuals, including both Twitter employees and individuals at contractors who had a level of authority within the system that would let them take over these accounts. So that means there were a, at least a thousand different individuals who could have been spearfished or who could, quite frankly, have done the work themselves. But to me, this is not as much a Twitter issue, and believe me, Twitter needs to deal with this, as one that's an issue for companies, especially companies who have chief executives and other high-profile executives who have active social media accounts. And that's what should you be doing as an organization to protect the accounts of these high value individuals? You know, is this something that you should have gamed? And this is one that I'm actually going to turn to my co-host, Brian McHenry, and ask him first. And this is one of those things that in some ways is similar to the, the deep fakes that we've been talking about uh, in an artificial intelligence context where someone is spoofing your high value employee. Is this something that should be on the radar screen 
for security organizations within the enterprise? Absolutely. Um, so, so we covered in the earlier blip today, Kurt, uh, the rise of fishing and spear fishing and, and what I termed whaling, which is a, a less well-known term, but whaling just being a, a sort of a variant of spear fishing where they're targeting key employees, right? The, the attackers are doing extensive reconnaissance when they set up these, uh, these attacks and the, whether they're done via an email campaign or social engineering over the phone. Um, if you have uh, employees that are high value individuals or people who have uh, extensive access, right? Somebody, you know, so, you know, organizations start to need to start looking internally and saying, who are my high value employees? Who are the employees who are going to be targeted? And Twitter, the example here would be like, all right, so you have a thousand people that have this level of access. And and as you turn over employees, this, this is going to become known out in the world, right? So you have to assume that that it's not a secret that everybody that that this is how your access is deployed. Um, so that, that that brings up another topic up around least privilege, right? And and probably that's too many people having this level of access uh, is probably what a lot of people are are thinking as as they listen to the show today. But so so one thing is least privilege, and we could talk about that at length. But here, you know really look at, you know, when you're t thinking about cybersecurity awareness training, which does work, right? There's a lot of proof out there, good cybersecurity awareness training, although for uh, folks who are in the industry, like you and me, Kurt and Lou, you you go through cybersecurity awareness training, you're like, oh my God, this is this is so remedial, right? Uh, because we're, we're very adept. It actually is proven to be very effective in helping bring the non-tech savvy uh, employee up to speed and, and, and making them more able to spot when someone's trying to social engineer them, when someone is sending them a spear phishing attack, uh, you know, looking for things like fraud, you know wire fraud and and somebody asking you to send large sums of money to to banks or do things that are a little bit out of the normal uh, even though it looks like it's coming from someone you trust uh, so so having cybersecurity awareness training is really important what I would say though is to kind of really look at the threat model though and say do I need to do more extensive cybersecurity awareness training for these these individuals who are going to be more targeted right so there's the training you roll out to the whole organization and there's the levels of uh, you know multi-factor authentication the level of strong authentication that you might roll out to cert to, to everyone but then you know look at that c-suite look at the people that have you know specialized access might be and might be targeted and think about how do we how do we provide more security for those individuals whether it's through training whether it's through stronger authentication whether it's you know just you know better architecture for the things that they have access to and and that's really where where I'm thinking that you know if there's a lesson to be pulled from this, not just to go and and shame Twitter for for how badly they got owned here, uh, but really kind of say, all right, this is a moment where we can we can all learn something and hope that you know we don't wander down the same fraught path and, and end up on the headlines. I want to turn to you to to take on uh, this whole thing about learning something. There are people who say that there would not be such a problem if these high-value individuals weren't out there actively tweeting quite so much. So the question is, how much control should an organization be able to exert over the social media um, accounts of its employees? Is this something where uh, a, an organization should have the ability to tell all of its employees not to to go out and tweet or to post on Instagram? Or is this an issue for high value employees only or should it be hands off completely when it comes to the enterprise? I mean, to me, there's a lot of vectors here. I think the problem is, and, and Bam brought up a good point about threat modeling, because if you think about it, there's a lot of edge services here, right? Which include things like Git repositories on um, public services, message boards, Reddit and others, social networking. And you'll find that with all of these, you know, it doesn't really matter if you have the high, quote unquote, high value C-suite type of individual or even people who work on the teams or kind of the lower level uh, individual contributors. You you're still a kind of weak link. There's still kind of a weak link. It's it's a hard problem. And I and I, I kind of think I, I basically agree with what Bam is saying is 
Awareness and training is really one of the most important things here because it actually shows the users, shows the people what they should be talking about, what they shouldn't be talking about, um, you know, about services. In fact, what they should be taking pictures of and what they shouldn't be taking pictures of. A lot of people like to use Instagram and take pictures of their setup or their what they're working on or or or, you know, issues they're running into. And it it opens the door to uh, potential uh, threats um, because they're leaking information about their environment, about what they're working on. Um, and, and so it, you could talk about these high value individual C-suite that are talking about the business and talking about what's next. And that could affect the business. But sometimes it's the lower level. It's the weakest links that can cause the even more problems. So is there a solution for this? I, again, I think more around awareness and training, but it doesn't really stop that rogue user. The ones that are, you know, unhappy about something and they want to just cause damage. And I think there's really no way for an organization to control that. Um, somebody can pop on their cell phone on a cellular network that's not on their network and go and, and post something somewhere. So, you know, it, it, again, I, I think it's a lot around awareness and training and, and making sure that they're mitigated by also, um, you know, tracking these things and making sure that, you know, these potential things don't leak out and when they do being able to, um, uh, to be able to be able to actually um, uh, go out and talk, say, send their own message about it. Well, being able to control the message, to be able to remediate, all of this is going to be important. And I have a feeling it's the sort of thing that more and more companies are going to be looking at now that we've had this very strong example of just how badly things can go wrong. Well, that's going to bring this bite to a close. With that, we'll hand it back to Lou to move us forward into what I think is going to be a great guest segment here on Twyatt. Thank you, Kurt. That's right. Next up, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyatt, right? I'm excited about that. But before we get to that, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Salesforce Service Cloud. Now, you all know I know CRM, right? And I can tell you there's a reason why Salesforce Service Cloud is the world's number one customer service platform. It really does empower organizations anywhere to deliver service from anywhere at any time. Now, Salesforce's Service Cloud wants you to be prepared during these unknown times. They understand that you're trying to do more with less resources, hustling to adapt to new customer needs and innovating your business to respond to the current environment. You want satisfied customers, which means you need a platform that performs quickly and efficiently to meet their needs. Now, from out of the box to fully customizable support, Find the best solution for your customers. A service cloud allows you to rapidly respond to customer needs on any channel. Think about all the channels you have, like chat or SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and more. From office, in the in the field, or in the office, and or at home. You can provide instant support with self-service portals, connect customers to articles, account info, and community members to find answers instantly. Work smarter with built-in AI, embedded AI-powered chat box to help resolve customer issues quickly give your service team the tools to provide an unforgettable customer experience resolve cases faster while using the suite of intelligent productivity tools giving agents a complete shared view of every customer and interaction they have now utilize the capability of personalizing every customer conversation and allow them to always respond with the right level of service Built on a fast, flexible platform, Salesforce Service Cloud enables trailblazers to provide world-class service anytime, anywhere, whether it's messaging, chat, phone, self-service, or in-person. Over 150,000 companies keep their customers happy with Salesforce. And remember, register today for Service Change Makers, a free virtual event for transferring your business at bit.ly slash service change makers. Join professionals from across the country, for online learning, sharing, and networking. Whether you're new to Salesforce or a longtime service cloud user, all are welcome here. Register today and mark your calendar for July 28th. More details to follow once registration is complete. Provide your customer service agents with a fast, flexible service platform that keeps them and your customers happy. Go to bit.ly slash Salesforce for service to find out how the world's number one service platform can help grow your business. That's bit.ly slash Salesforce for service. And we thank Salesforce Service Cloud for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyatt Rye. And today we have Hitesh Patel. He's the Senior Director of Product Management for Automation, Orchestration, and Ecosystems over at F5. Welcome to the show, Hitesh. Hey, how you doing, man? 
doing great. Thank you for being here. So our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. So before we get into all the nitty gritty about DevOps and automation, can you maybe take us through the journey that you had through tech and what brought you to F5? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it started, uh, I think, uh, 15 when I was 15. So I've been uh, I've been uh, bit by the bug early. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I really cut my teeth kind of uh, in in the the bowels of, uh, of IT. Um, so a long, long path uh, that involved, you know, software development, uh, you know, working with networks. Uh, uh, at some point in my career, I've always been involved with, uh, you know, kind of desktops and supporting end users and things like that. So um, really started there uh, and then, uh, you know, progressed through that. And eventually, um, while I uh, love software development and I still uh, actually have done that for most of my career, uh, I kind of focused in on uh, the networking side of things uh, and uh, went up into uh, stints in uh, kind of running uh, large networks for uh, for carriers. Speaking of uh, uh, what you're talking about earlier in terms of uh, BGP and things like that, I actually had uh, <laughs> Carrier BGP on the resume for a number of years, um, up into web hosting, uh, and then made the made the switch over into uh, the vendor space. Uh, took that network knowledge um, and actually married it with um, the development uh, aspects of uh, of my hobbies in uh, technology that I'd always had, uh, but pulled that together a little more to to get a little more holistic view of um, of what I could. Uh, could do for uh, for where I worked, but also uh, what I could do uh, as part of my career, right? Combining that network uh, expertise uh, along with uh, the ability to understand how applications work, um, how to actually develop them, what the processes is around on that, and and ultimately, you know, what the problems are. Uh, how do you actually go in and make those things better? Uh, landed at F5, uh, carried a bag for a number of years as an SE, uh, and then uh, ended up in product management. So now I uh, I make things, and I've always made things, but now I have a title that says I make things. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Now, from your title, it seems that you're definitely an expert in DevOps. Is that right? Can you maybe take us through some of the things that you focus on? Yeah, sure. So for us, um, you know, at, at F5, um, really what it's been about is uh, marrying uh, the processes that we've seen actually in software development. And if you look at the history of DevOps, it's really rooted in um, agile development pra uh, practices uh, and marrying the speed that agile gives you um, with the ability to actually deliver that through uh, infrastructure and out to an end user. Um, and so what we have been doing um, at F5 and what I've, you know, kind of taken uh, taken a, a passion uh, about is um, really getting that working, taking and saying, right, the infrastructure elements that are involved in delivering an application, that are involved in delivering security, um, can work uh, in an agile manner, can work in a DevOps-centric uh, uh, manner following the DevOps methodology. And what that ends up actually doing is improving all the things that we keep saying are, are issues in infrastructure, security. Security, uh, ability to make changes quickly, ability to recover quickly. Uh, in fact, all the things you talked about uh, in the uh, bite around Cloudflare, um, there's correlates to all of that within how uh, you would implement DevOps and how you could use DevOps tooling and methodologies to actually improve those situations for uh, for end users. Right, a little bit. You talk a little bit about Cloudflare and, and how to handle these kind of end-to-end -end solutions. You know, we we talked a little about. We've had a lot of guests on talk about DevSecOps and how it helps with you know with ensuring these kind of end-to-end -end pipelines are more secure what are you seeing some of the organizations doing to help secure these things uh, and actually remove the barrier uh, from securing devops pipelines yeah so um, we're seeing a lot and we actually you know we have some uh, uh, a state of application services report that fi publishes um, every year and um, one of the interesting findings was that um, customers are putting a priority. It's one of the top three priorities is automation. Uh, the top, one of the other top priorities is security. And uh, for me, it's just marry those together. Why are they separate? Um, <laughs> what's the, always the approach I've taken. Why do you automate something first and then secure it second? Why don't you just do that at the same time? Um, the tools, um, exist. Um, I will say that, you know, some of the tools aren't as mature as they need to be, but I think uh, we're making great progress there. And speaking from, you know, the vendor side of the, the, the spectrum, um, there are companies like F5 that are putting a huge amount of effort into making sure that not only do you get security, but you get the efficacy out of uh, the security features. And I think 
that's where we're at right now with DevSecOps. This is not just about saying, hey, uh, I can automate uh, the, this insertion of a security service or a control uh, into a pipeline. That is fairly well understood and frankly, um, is fairly straightforward to get to. It's around doing the harder things now where you're looking at the actual efficacy of that control. Uh, maybe it's a policy element you're deploying or something like that and making sure that it can actually solve uh, in-depth problems, things like uh, APT, things like uh, being able to auto learn and auto profile the application so you don't have to constantly tweak policy and things like that. Um, those are the things that um, are now uh, getting very good. And also we need to accelerate the adoption of uh, in environments. Um, one thing I hear um, from customers a lot is uh, we'll go in, we'll show some interesting technology, whether that's F5 or just, you know, being a being a technologist looking and saying, hey, why don't you look at this open source project? Why don't you look at this other way of doing things? Um, organizations generally are not uh, uh, averse to that. They, they want to see it, but they're not adopting them fast enough. And so that's part of what I think needs to happen is not just the technology needs to evolve. Um, it's going to continue to evolve. And, and certainly there are people that are out there um, working on that all the time. But it's also the organization and the ability for them to take that and actually rapidly change their operational principles. Uh, to actually use that technology in their in their environments. Makes sense, makes sense. Well, I do want to bring my co-host in early here because I think, of course, you have a cohort here uh, from F5, and I think he wants to give you a little bit of trouble. So I'm going to throw it over to Brian first uh, to, to, to ask you some questions. Yeah, full, full disclosure for the Twyat Riot, uh, Hitesh and I have probably shared more than our share of uh, cocktails, beers, and, and meals <laughs> over the last, uh, most of the last decade. So so we're we're not just uh, two random guys from F5, but we're two, two guys in F5 that have been on the same teams at different points and uh, certainly work together quite a lot. Um, with that being said, man, you're, you're talking about profiling, auto-learning, um, this sounds like code for AI to me, right? And so everybody's jumping yep. in on the AI bandwagon. But F5, I mean, if I'm, if I'm going to speak for, for our audience here, F5 isn't known as an AI-driven company or as an innovator in AI. So so it's interesting that an, somebody from F5's product management team is coming on here and telling us, you know, kind of in a, in a sneaky way that we're going we're gonna to drop some AI on them, uh, perhaps. Is that is that what you're saying? And and and. Maybe can you support that F5 can deliver, um, you know, AI-driven capabilities? Yeah, um, I, I am saying that. Um, I will be measured in that, right? Because I think the term AI and um, the application of AI is... Um, is, is part of the issue here, right? You can't uh, solve every problem right now with AI. Um, but um, there is a long tail there. There is a future that we're looking at as, uh, as AI itself matures. You mentioned GPT-3 uh, earlier. If you look at the, uh, the development of natural language processing, you'll see that um, they've doubled the progress in that in half the time. And if you guys know Moore's Law, we're all in technology and we, we probably know Moore's Law have heard of it. Uh, you look at AI and you start to see the same sort of curve, not exactly, but you start to see the same sort of curve start showing up in the advances there. So am I saying that, uh, that we're going to use AI uh, at some point to solve these problems? Um, yes. Am I saying that we're not exactly sure how yet? Uh, yes, I am. Um, the key part of this is not looking at just AI. And, and this is the, the agnostic part, right? Uh, this is the part that applies um, just outside of my, my hat at F5 and why I'm really excited to kind of about this new part of my career, which is going into the space. Um, AI is actually built on the ability to, to get data and get relevant data and be able to collect that data ahead of knowing how to actually solve the problem or what tools you'd use to solve the problem. Um, and that's one of the places where F5 um, has actually had a, a lot of experience. Um, if you've used any of our solutions, um, we see everything that goes through, let's say, our uh, load balancing products, right? Um, we're decrypting the traffic. Uh, we're able to see uh, the stream as it sits on the network, as it's going through us, and process that in near real time. Um, what we can do with that is actually use that as the foundation to say, right, how do we leverage that data and how do we actually start feeding that into what will be the way that we solve these problems? Um, we have done, uh, and it's, it's interesting because we're not seen as an AI company, uh, but uh, customers have been using AI-like or, uh, or, or, or 
you know, kind of profile type features uh, for a very long time. Uh, uh, Bam, you're, you're familiar with this one. Uh, in our WAF product, in our web application firewall product, we have a thing called Policy Builder. It sits there, it looks at your traffic, and it figures out how to build that policy for you. It actually gives you suge suggestions. Um, what we're looking at, though, is a scale way beyond that, right? Uh, to solve the problems that we have nowadays, uh, you have to actually collect more data. And that's actually where uh, recently we had an acquisition of Shape, uh, Shape Security. Um, and they are, uh, if I said, you know, on one end of the stack with the web application firewall and seeing the traffic, that's one side of it. Uh, Shape is really focused on what's happening out at the endpoint, out in the browser, what the actor is actually doing. Um, what I'm looking at now is, right, how do we take that um, the data both at the endpoint and in the infrastructure, marry that with performance data and say, right, how do we actually get a solve that, that helps to get to the root of problems? Um, I'll give you an example, uh, the Cloudflare issue. One thing that I can definitely know because uh, we've had customers tell us this, when that issue happened, they didn't understand if it was their problem or someone else's. Um, and I don't mean that in a finger pointing way, but one of the things around DevOps is having a full kind of end to end view, having a systems level view of your uh, of your system and then having also that informed by what the end user is seeing. And uh, one of the things we want to do is marry the data together, not just security, but performance, and then third-party data sources, uh, things like checking uh, what are the common resolvers out there. Uh, Cloudflare is one of them, but Google uh, uh, runs another one. If anyone's been in IT for long enough, they know 4.2.2.2, uh, like the back of, you know, they can type that very quickly. Um, these are all common things, and it's actually marrying that data together to give you a quicker idea of what's going on in the environment from a performance and security standpoint that matters. Right, right. Yeah. I, well, I when we come back, we do want, we do want to get into this more. I want to bring you guys back in um, and talk about it more. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this weekend, Enterprise Tech, and that's ZipRecruiter. Now, hiring can be difficult, but if you're a company that's currently trying to hire, you face new difficulties. That's right. Housing Wire could relate to this because they needed to hire an ambitious reporter to cover news stories on the U.S. housing markets. So they actually turned to ZipRecruiter, and that's how Housing Wire found Alexandra Roja. Now, Alexandra Roja never imagined she could actually become a reporter, even especially during the COVID-19 period. So she created a profile on ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter matched Alexandra to Housing Wire's reporter job because her degree and writing skills are actually fit great with that role. Now, Housing Wire received her application only four hours after they posted the job. And a few weeks later, Alexandra started her dream career. Now, there are lots of organizations out there expanding during this period. I, I actually posted a position on ZipRecruiter that required very specific skill sets. Now, in other places, I wasn't getting any hits at all to actually the similar posting. However, ZipRecruiter was able to connect me with the candidates that had similar skills and the capacity to learn some of those new skills that I was looking for and develop those skills that I needed. Now, imagine being connected to a new opportunity where you can develop new skills just by entering your current skills. That's right. They really do have a great platform and they might just connect you up with your dream job. Now, let ZipRecruiter help you hire and see why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Try it out for free right now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Hitesh Patel, Senior Director of Product Management over at F5. Now, Hitesh, I want to, again, bring bring these guys back in because, again, they have some good insights on the current market and trends. Uh, Brian, I know you had some more questions. I'll throw it back to you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested, like, you know, we hear a lot about how is this different from, you know, what you're talking about different from like uh, APM or application performance management, right? How is this different from, you know, so-called like, you know, a SIM tool that's just going to, you know, crunch your, your security events. I think that's where I think uh, if, if I'm an enterprise professional today, I'm just getting inundated with a lot of stuff that sounds very samey. Right. And, um, you know, what can you do to kind of clarify what, what you mean by analytics and AI and driving, you know, more agile processes, uh, and, and, you know, how does, how does, how does, how does this differentiate itself from things that we already have? Yeah. 
Yeah. So look, um, I think uh, when we're looking at it, and I'll go back, uh, you know, to to something I mentioned earlier, which is the the, the systems level view, right? Um, if you if you look at um, and if you take an honest look at it, right? And I think that that's what's required here. If you ask uh, yourself, do I really have an all up systems level view of, of the thing I'm running, whatever it is, right? Um, whether that's uh, in tech an application, or maybe, you know, if you're, if you're uh, out there, do, uh, you know, servicing jets all day, if you're flying planes and stuff, do you have a systems level view? Um, when you look at technology, um, what you'll see is that I actually see a siloed view. Um, and uh, what you actually have is very deep uh, tools that um, will look at a silo and say, right, I'll tell you everything about that silo. Um, and then generally what you'll see is, okay, well, we'll go into the adjacencies because you know people are gonna ask that. How does the part that I'm in relate to the parts around me, the, that surround me in some cases? Um, and that's fine, but what you start to run into a problem with is, first of all, that that breadth becomes challenging, right? Um, when you start expanding out that breadth, um, you, you suffer in a way. And this is a very real practical thing in uh, development, in software development, is how many things are you going to be an expert at? In fact, that's a human thing. How many things can you be an expert in? Um, so what I what I look at is actually saying we want to create a more complete view. And I think where um, we suffer a little bit right now is first in um, the delivery and security infrastructure uh, of uh, of an application, right? Um, we we all know that uh, there's, there's the, the backend stack where the code is running, you've got storage and all those things back there that are actually uh, doing the work in terms of delivering the application content to a customer or to a user. Um, then you've got this kind of gray area in the middle and I call it the network slash security infrastructure slash uh, application delivery controllers slash CDN slash uh, in the cloud WAF slash cloud provider itself. All of those things are there in the middle. And when you go look at that, and you go say, right, how do I get that all all that stuff telling me whether is it working or not? Most people, when I ask this same question, are just going to say, I have no clue. I have to go to 17 different tools. All of them will show me green, by the way. Every single one of them is green all the time. And the reason is because if you only deviate, and I'll, I'll set up a thought experiment, if every thing in the chain, if you have eight things in the chain there, well, every one of them only deviates by 10%, every one of them is still green. Your end user still has a problem, though. Um, so it's taking that middle part, um, making that less opaque, uh, doing our part as an F5. We have access to a lot of that data, just where we sit in the environment, right? So just democratize that, show it, show what's going on and give insights and conclusions. Uh, but then also marry the end user perspective. And I want to kind of end on that. None of this matters if I'm just giving you the biased view that I feel makes me look good in front of my boss or fulfills the five nines thing. Um, what I really want to look at is a more empathetic view of what the end user has to deal with and saying, we're giving you the view that your users see. And your view of it may look all green, but it doesn't really matter because your end user view is what really needs to take precedence. And then let's go and fix and solve towards that. Right, right, makes sense. Well, I do want to bring Kurt in because he's been chomping at the bit behind the scenes here. Kurt? I appreciate that. Uh, Hitesh, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit, you, you, you've you been mentioning the ability of the the owner, the client, to be able to, to have confidence in what the system is doing. When you're talking to them, when, when you're you're working through their problems, is there a significant gap between their confidence in the ability to protect and deliver the application and the actual ability to do that? Yep. You know, is there a confidence gap in either direction with most people either being over or under confident? I think uh, just human nature is that you're going to tend towards being overconfident there, um, you know, and that's that's something that you can't um, I, I don't think you can always solve. Right. I think humans tend to hope for the best. That's a good thing, by the way. Uh, I love that about humanity and my friends and the people I interact with is that we all tend to hope for the best. Um, Really, what I, I think it boils down to, Curtis, is um, what I call the gut feel. And this is something that, um, you know, I've had uh, my career in operations, right? I, I did a very long time in just running these environments. And I think anybody that's done that for, uh, you know, five, 10 years, 
you develop this gut feel of how things should operate. Um, you develop that over years and years of experience. And that gut feel is good. The problem, though, the problem nowadays is that gut feel isn't possible anymore. So it used to be I had a gut feel. I knew that a VLAN was working this way. I knew the ARP worked that way. I knew that TCP worked this way. And I knew that in my network, which is a collection of uh, layer two and layer three devices, this is how it worked. All of that has changed. In fact, it's not just that now. You have multi-cloud environments. You have applications running in all these different environments. And the ability for a person to have a gut feel is almost impossible because you have to develop operational experience across five to six different environments. Let's say you're leveraging you know, a private uh, kind of a classic environment in a private cloud and then two or three public clouds. You've got SaaS offerings and applications there. I, I'll ask anybody in operations, how do you develop your gut feel? Where we want to uh, bring in help there is we can develop the gut feel. We have, uh, you know, as they say, we have the technology, you know, we have the $6 million uh, AI thing. Uh, but um, what we want to do is start pulling the data together to help develop that gut feel capability again um, and help practitioners, people running these things, actually see and correlate and put the data together in a way that they can make a uh, decision. Uh, in some future world, maybe those decisions are automated. Maybe they result in automated action. Um, but I think we're a way away from that. Um, we have to first show people that we can make the right call with these automated systems uh, based on that data. And we have to do it because, look, the reality of it is I can't become an expert in any more uh, networking technologies. I'm at my capacity level. I guess I'm getting a little older. Uh, maybe that's something to do with it. But I would venture to say that you, I'm kind of at my capacity level. I can't learn more. I can't consume more information. I need technology to help me develop that gut feel and inform the right actions based on data. My son once told me when I was asking him about schoolwork that all the drawers in his brain were full. And uh, I think what you're talking about is uh, a, a brain full of, of entirely filled drawers. But, but I, I do want to ask one more question. You're talking about the gut feel. And a lot of people in finance have the gut feeling that when you're talking about infrastructure and especially security infrastructure, you're talking about pure expense, pure cost. And especially in these times, companies are reluctant to, to go big on things that are pure cost. They, they want something to enhance revenue. So are there ways to get beyond the pure cost way of looking at, at, at all of these products and services? You know, can they be seen as something that provides a genuine way to to enhance revenue or at least enhance customer retention? So, look, I think um, it goes to, you know, the, first of all, your brand, right? Um, we know Twitter is suffering a little bit right now. Um, you know, this this is it's an embarrassing thing. It was 45 people, but it was arguably 45 of the biggest people. Um, and it does affect your brand. I can guarantee you the folks that uh, at least a portion of the folks that have that little, you know, verified badge on their Twitter uh, profile are definitely looking and saying, right, what, you know, what happened here? Um, I don't want this to happen because it affects my brand. If you take it at a very personal level, right, that you on Twitter, your personal name, you, that you are the brand. And so having that uh, tampered with can be uh, very personally affecting. Um, but you can take that and you can you can plop it right into uh, into organizations. Right. Um, I think that's what it's really about. And, and the reality of it is, is that we've. Uh, we got to move on from saying, uh, first of all, that security is a cost uh, and only that. And we've got to move on from saying that we can't have speed and security. And that's a that's another aspect, I think, to the same uh, question, Curtis, is we are at the point right now. Um, and, and I won't say that we solve every problem, but technology is at the point where we can solve and say, you know what, um, brand uh, protection, uh, being able to say and and demonstrate that you are a secure organization, that you respect the data and privacy and security of your customers is an attribute of a brand. And there are uh, audiences out there that will pay more for it. In fact, if you're a service, um, I generally tend to just being in tech, right? I tend to actually pay a little more for the brands that I perceive and hopefully deliver on a little bit better security. Um, 
The other side of that is the speed aspect, right? People always say, well, security is a blocker. Look, um, you could say that and you can say it till the, till the cows come home. Uh, the reality of it is uh, the technology now is getting to a point where that is not actually the issue anymore uh, in at least some of the cases, but also a lot of them. Have we solved every problem? No, we haven't. Uh, does that mean uh, looking at, uh, you know, we I use the example of GBT two to three and the time that it took to make such advances, right? You, people need to look at things on that sort of scale from that perspective, right, is saying, I know the technology is in infancy, but if we invest and we really go down this route, think about the gains that you can get in a very quick amount of time to really solve the root problem and, and frankly, create a better uh, situation for everyone. It's not just about tech. It's actually how this affects people's lives and making sure that as we leverage technology anymore, especially like in the middle of a pandemic, we're doing everything online now. Uh, as a result of that, um, how do we actually make sure that customers are looking at that and saying, hey, security is not just a, a nice to have. It is something that differentiates and it is something from an organizational perspective that we can do at speed and uh, is a, a positive attribute of our product and our brand. Right. I think at speed is the trick, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Hey, Hitesh, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we're running a little low on time. I did want to give you the chance to tell the folks at home where they can go, where their organization could go to maybe learn a little bit more about some of the new offerings from F5. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, if you go to f5.com slash beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N, um, you can see a lot of what I've been talking about uh, here. Um, my team has been um, working uh, very hard to actually bring a lot of what I talked about to uh, to reality, right? And, and that's encompassed in a product uh, called Beacon. Um, it gives you that end-to-end -end view uh, of your application. We definitely pull in uh, data from, you know, our F5 uh, uh, portfolio of, of products, including um, you know, Nginx product shape and the uh, and the uh, F5 portfolio. But I wanted to end on uh, that's not it. That's not just it. It's not just showing what the F5 stuff is doing or the Nginx or the shape stuff is doing. It's marrying that together, giving you a view of what the security posture is, how that relates and how that impacts your end user experience, and then giving you the confidence and building that gut feel, like I said, giving you the confidence to say, hey, I think this is what's going on. Here is where we need to focus our resources. Here's where we need to go improve rather than kind of making guesses in all these disparate environments that we're now dealing with. Thanks. Thanks again for being here, Tesh. Thank you, guys. Well, folks, thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. It's after another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your device to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, of course. Starting with everyone, Mr. Brian McHenry. Bam, what's going on for you in this coming week? Where can people find you? Well, uh, I'll be getting back to work this week after going through my move. And uh, I... Definitely recommend going and checking out f5labs.com. Uh, we had a pretty serious vulnerability come out uh, la uh, right before 4th of July. Uh, been behind the scenes working to get a, a good response out there. If you tuned into YouTube, you can go on our YouTube channel and uh, check out some of the live streams we recorded. I was actually on there. Uh, answering questions directly from our customers and how to mitigate, how to detect if they've been compromised. Um, if you haven't patched your big IP system yet, uh, please do. It's it's really vitally important that you do so. Even if you feel like you've done a good job of securing your device and air gapping those management networks, um, we, we really encourage you to, to get to a fixed version of code uh, as soon as you can. And I know that's hard. Uh, but we're here to help our security incident response team is available uh, just by dialing up our support line, whether you open a support case email through the web portal or, or, or on the phone, uh, ask for the, the, the SIRT, the, the CERT or uh, incident response team, and they're there to help you. Uh, and you might even get the internet famous Megazone, who's one of our top uh, uh, engineers. And that is his legal name, if you if you must know. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Well, folks, we also thank our famous Mr. Curtis Franklin as well. He's the senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week and where can people find you? Well, as we noted at the beginning of the show, we're starting that mad rush into Black Cat uh, and DEF CON to follow. Got lots and lots of stuff coming up, previewing some of the great teaching that's going to be going on a lot of the briefings that are happening at Black Hat. There's a ton of great 
uh, video that's going to be happening. I know that many of the speakers are already putting those together, so their presentations are going to be just top-notch. I'm going to be getting ready for that. I'll be covering the show, and as always, you can find my writing at darkreading.com, especially at the edge of dark reading. Every time I put something up, I'll point to it in my account at Twitter at KG4GWA or over on Instagram, Kurt underscore Franklin. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you all for being here. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you, right? So listen, we want to listen and catch up on your enterprise news. We want you to go right now to our show page, twit.tv slash twilight. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, all the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and the links of the stories we're doing in the show. But more importantly... Right next to those videos right there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version and your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or even on any one of your podcast applications. We're on all of them, so check it out and subscribe to Twide. It's really the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. Now, after you subscribe, impress your friends, your family, your coworkers, whoever by sharing the gift of Twy, because you know what? They need to stay on top of their IT and enterprise news as well. Now, if we've already subscribed, and if you're available, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Fridays, right now, we do the show live at live.twit.tv. That's live.twit.tv. Come see how the show is run. Come see how the pizza's made. We, we do all the banter and everything before the show, after the show. Please come in and jump and watch the show live. Plus, if you're going to watch the show live, we also have a chat room as well, irc.twit.tv. We have a great set of characters in there. We always have some some reoccurrence of people in there that bring some really great content. Thank you so much for all the chat room and all the all the characters in there. We really appreciate it. If you want to jump in, irc.twit.tv. Now, if you can't watch the show live or be part of the chat room live, you know what? There's still a great conversation happening 24-7 over at our twit.community website, twit.community. There's a great set of content out there. The hosts are out there. The Sometimes the guests come out there. Um, the Twit community is out there. They're talking about technology, about topics of the shows, all types of stuff. So come be, be part of the discussion 24-7 at twit.community. Now, you remember, you can always follow me at twitter.com slash loumm. There I post all my enterprise and IT tidbits. Plus, I have great conversations with pe- people like you. So please come out and have a great conversation. Plus, we I also post a lot of the work that I do at Microsoft. Um, you can check out that work as well as at developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we po- post all the latest and greatest ways you can customize your office experience to make it more easy and better productive for your organization. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week, and we couldn't do this week at Enterprise Tech without them. So thank you for all their support. I also want to thank everyone at all the staff members and everyone at Twit, um, especially the engineers. Also, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi. He isn't here as our co-host today, but he's not only our co-host normally, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings and all the plannings for the show and we really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. I know you're looking in the background there. Um, and we also uh, wish you good luck because, of course, the this is hurricane season in, in Hawaii. So hopefully everything is going well. Uh, we say a prayer. Uh, before we sign out, I want to thank also our TD for today, Jeff. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. How are things going there at Twit? And has anything changed? Nothing has changed yet. The uh, virus is still spiking here in California. But uh, I got to say, Twit is one of the safest companies uh, around. We're doing everything right. And everybody that comes in here is fully protected. And uh, we keep our face mask on all day long. Even if there's only two people in here and we're working at opposite ends of the building, we are, uh, we're fully following the uh, guidelines. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I, I'm just impressed with Twit uh, putting out all this content even during this time. So it's been it's been wonderful to work with everybody there. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Twit, I just want to say, is an amazing company. Everybody here works really, really, really hard, and the communication is awesome. Fantastic. Well, folks, until next time, I'm Louis Moresco. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. 
I'm Jason Howell, host of Tech News Weekly here on Twit.tv, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Each and every week, we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. It could be journalists writing amazing tech stories. It could be experts. It could be the sources of the stories themselves, developers, you name it. We bring them onto the show, and we talk to them about why their story is resonating with the world. You can watch and subscribe by going to twit.tv slash TNW. Make sure you do that and you won't miss a single episode. We'll see you there.